Hello. Uh, right, this week we're going to talk about the palate. That is uh, the roof of your mouth. I, th I, mean, I feel it's a fairly straightforward bit of anatomy, but when I talk to students about what makes up this bit and the other, they seem to be confused. I'm also struggling to know how much detail to include here, so I've been faffing about a little bit. What I'm going to do is we'll talk about the major parts, what makes the major parts, add a smattering of detail as we go, talk about the hard palate, soft palate, the muscles that form the soft palate, what happens when they contract, a few nerves, bits and bobs, I don't know, we'll just make it up as we go, shall we? What do we mean when we say the palate? Well, this is what we're talking about here. Like I said, it's the roof of the mouth. It's the roof of the oral cavity. It's got two parts. It's got a hard palate and a soft palate. So the hard palate is bony. Which bone makes up the hard palate? Okay, which bones make up the hard palate? And then the soft palate, oh, you can feel this yourself, right? You can lose your tongue. I feel the hard palate and it ends posteriorly at a certain point, and then it becomes muscular. Uh, I don't know how far back you can go, um, <laughs> but it ends as the uvula, the dangly bit at the back there, right? And that's the, the palate, the hard and the soft palate. So it's separating off the oral cavity from the nasal cavity. And in fact, the reason the soft palate is mobile is so that you can separate off fully the nasal cavity from the oral cavity. So when you're just breathing through your mouth, what you've just done there is you've elevated the soft palate and you've pulled it back against because I'm only breathing through my mouth right now and talking. You've pulled the soft palate up against the posterior part of the pharynx. If I try and breathe in through my nose, I can't. The importance of that is, is so that uh, when you're swallowing, food only goes down the pharynx, goes down the esophagus, rather than going back up into your nasal cavity. So of course when kids are laughing and the soft palate's flapping around and they're drinking milk, that's why they snort milk out of their nose because they don't lift the soft palate up fully and separate off the nasal cavity from the oral cavity. So, <coughs> no, yeah, that sort of thing, right? So that's what the palate is. Here's something I don't, I don't get is, um, oh, I've chosen a skull I can't take apart. I have. See, I want to be able to take the, uh, the mandible off. Uh, without the technicians uh, getting upset with me. These are cool, they've got springs on the side like the muscles of mastication. Anyway, the thing I don't get is, if I take the hard palate, the thing I don't get is, where does the word palate come from? Why is this called the palate? Some of you guys might be able to help me with this, but I've, I've searched around. So the Palatine Hill in Rome is one of the seven hills of Rome. And Palatine, since then, has come to mean palace but it's not clear where the word palatine came from originally. Is, is the palate is curved, right? So is the palate referring to the shape of the palatine hill? Because it's, it, look it up, it's in a really um, central location, a really uh, important part of Rome. So maybe this is referring to um, the palatine hill. Anyway, of course, when we talk about palates, we think about taste, you know, somebody has a, a fine palate, but the palate doesn't actually have any taste buds in it. Uh, your tongue does that. So this is the hard palate. And what bone is making up the hard palate? It's the maxilla. This is the maxilla here. Originally two bones that fuse in the midline with time. So much of the hard palate is the maxilla and it is curved and arched. And if you close your mouth, you can feel with your tongue, there's not actually a lot of room in there. So the tongue, when it's in your mouth, is, you know, it's, it's drawn in so it's fatter, deeper, wider, well, so it's filling all the space in the oral cavity available to it. So the palate is, um, the hard palate is arched to make space for your tongue, really. Um, but what, we, what we've also got here is not just the maxilla, but there's a suture back here and we have two bones on either side, and these are the palatine bones. They're kind of like, um, they're kind of like tall triangles, really, or like, yeah. So they've got, they've got kind of got a flat, they're the posterior most part of the hard palate, so they form the posterior edge of the hard palate. You can see the nasal cavities in here, um, but then these are the pterygoid wings, or the pterygoid plates of the uh, sphenoid bone. They're 
extending from here up to form kind of parts of the walls of the nasal cavity. So the hard palate is formed by the maxilla and the left and right palatine bones. They're covered, in, uh, covered by mucosa in life. You can, you're going to have to do a fair bit of mirrors and lights and looking at the own, your own roof of your palate to see some of the things I'm going to talk about. But the palate is covered by mucosa, just like the oral cavity is lined with mucosa, which is filled with glands and what have you. And there's, um, there's kind of a depression here, which gets called the incisive fossa. Now these, these are the incisors, right? So this is the incisive fossa here, kind of this depression. And you can see there's a hole there. This is the incisive foramen. Ah, right, okay. So there's a hole here. And we also see holes here and here. So we've got the greater palatine foramen and lesser palatine foramen on either side. So we have um, nerves, so we have palatine nerves and blood vessels passing to the palate from these superior spaces through these foramina. This foramen here is actually a canal, so it's the incisive canal, and through here pass uh, the nasopalatine nerves and blood vessels, and through the greater and lesser palatine foramina, we see the greater and lesser palatine nerves running through there. Okay, so cranial nerves. What cranial nerve is going to carry general sensation from the palate, from the roof of your mouth? The trigeminal nerve. Very good. Cranial nerve 5. The trigeminal nerve, cranial nerve 5, is the general sensory nerve of the face. So it's going to send general sensory branches through here. We won't go we won't follow all the way back. Um, but we also need parasympathetic innervation and sympathetic innervation to you know, drive gland function and constrict um, blood vessels and that sort of thing. So which cranial nerve is going to send parasympathetic fibres to the, to the palate? Go on, go for it. Go for the snotty, weepy, dribbly nerve of the face. It's the facial nerve, cranial nerve seven. It's got a number of sneaky branches that pass through and get to various spaces around here, but the nasal, sorry, but the greater and lesser palatine nerves and the nasopalatine nerves, if there are parasympathetic nerves passing to the, the mucosa of the palate, those are gonna be from the facial nerve, from cranial nerve seven. And the sympathetic nerves, of course, are all coming from the sympathetic trunk and following the blood vessels up and then diving forward. If you want to trace those parasympathetic fibers back, look up petrosal, all right? There are various petrosal nerves. <gasps> petrosal, petrus. Oh, we were talking about that last week or a couple of weeks ago. So the anterior two thirds of the palate are the hard palate formed by the maxilla and the palatine bones. The posterior third of the palate then is the soft palate and it's muscular. It's attached to the posterior edge of the hard palate, and there's an aponeurosis in there. So an aponeurosis is kind of like, um, it's like a flat, thickened tendon. So we have this tendinous or tendinomusculus section anteriorly. So the anterior part of the soft palate is an aponeurosis that starts off quite thick and gets thinner, and then the posterior part of the soft palate is more muscular and softer and more mobile and eventually ends as kind of a curved arch with the uvula hanging down, right? So um, muscles then are going to run between bones and the auditory tube um, and the soft palate and the pharynx and the tongue and they're going to form that soft palate and they're going to move that soft palate around. So what are the muscles then? Um, we could do them in pairs. There's two pairs and then another one. So if we think of, okay, the first pair, tensor veli palatini, levator veli palatini. Tensor veli palatini pulls from the medial pterygoid, or attaches to the medial pterygoid plate and the auditory tube. This is where things get tricky 3D, but look, here's the hard palate, here's the soft palate. That there is the opening of the auditory tube or the eustachian tube or the pharyngotympanic tube, whichever one you like. So tensor veli palatini is running from there and here into the aponeurosis of the soft palate. Um, and tensor veli palatini, when it contracts then, is going to both add tension to the soft palate. It's going to pull on the soft palate kind of laterally. But it's also going to, um, because it's attached to the opening of the 
auditory tube, it's also going to pull that open. So when you swallow, and the soft palate uh, moves up and down when you swallow, as we mentioned earlier, the muscles involved in moving the soft palate are also pulling on this opening of the auditory tube. And that's why when you're in a plane or the air pressure is changing, when you swallow, the pressure equalizes in your ears. It's because these muscles pull on the auditory tube, allows air in and out of the auditory tube. So then the pressure on either side of the tympanic membrane is the same. All right. Um, Levata veli palatini is similar. Levata veli palatini runs from the petrous part of the temporal bone um, and again the opening of the auditory tube to the aponeurosis um, of the soft palate. But Levata veli palatini is then going to help elevate the soft palate when it contracts um, and not just tense it. Levata veli palatini, tensor veli palatini. And then we've got um, two muscles. Running, running from the soft palate down here. One runs to the tongue, that's palatoglossus, and one runs to the pharynx, that's palatopharyngeus. And if you look inside your own mouth, you'll see these arches, these pillars on either side, running from the palate, one down to the tongue, one down to the pharynx. So palatoglossus then is going to pull the soft palate and the tongue closer together. So if the palate's fixed, it'll lift the tongue up. If the, you know what I mean? This, they're both mobile things, so they can both move together, but if one's fixed, the other one's gonna to move towards it. If you can pull the, 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 the tongue and the soft palate together, that means you can close off the oral cavity from the pharynx. So that means you can stop stuff in the mouth going down the airway. So that, that's kind of a useful function, isn't it? Palato, palatoglossus there. This then is an important part of swallowing. Palatopharyngeus then is very similar, but it, it, it's gonna pull the soft palate and the pharynx together. So it's gonna elevate the pharynx relative to the palate or whatever, you know. So when we, when we talked about swallowing and we talked about the pharynx and the larynx, everything moves up and down when you swallow. Palatopharyngeus is one of the muscles that's, that's involved with that. It's pulling the pharynx closer to the palate. Palatoglossus, palatopharyngeus, tensor veli palatini, levator veli palatini. There's one more, and it's, um, it's musculus uvulae. There's a little muscle running down in your uvula, uh -huh. down here, um, and it can shorten and shorten your uvula, musculus uvulae. So that, those are the five muscles of the soft palate. Can be very complex if you're trying to work out where they attach, but if you're trying to remember their names and their functions and their maybe innovation, that's, is that more useful? You see what I mean? I'm struggling with level of detail. Right, back to the cranial nerves. What cranial nerves innovate the muscles of the palate? Um, <laughs> uh, if you're into the embryology of the head and neck, this might make sense, but all of the muscles of the palate are innervated by cranial nerve 10, the vagus nerve, except for one. Tensor veli palatini is innervated by the trigeminal nerve, cranial nerve 5. Um, you know, you can probably remember that as tensor veli palatini, tensor trigeminal, the two T's, trigeminal nerve, cranial nerve 5. I don't know, whatever works for you. Okay, that's the anatomy. Um, a couple of other tidbits. If you look at the roof of your own mouth, um, you might be able to see a midline epithelial seam, um, a raphe. So there's a line linking the two sides of the mucosa of the palate, the left and right side. And that gives you a clue as to its embryological origin in that the, it, the face is made up of, what is it, five separate lumps, but we're talking about the palate today. And there are palatal shelves that start on the left and right sides and will come together and fuse and meet in the midline to form the complete palate. Sometimes that doesn't occur, it doesn't completely occur, leading to cleft palate. Um, the other thing you can see, and maybe feel in the roof of your mouth, are ridges, rugi, um, so lateral palatal folds in the mucosa in the roof of your mouth. 
And it might be not too pronounced or noticeable in you or other humans, but if you look in the roof of the mouth of a cat or a dog, they'll be really pronounced. So this is, um, this is friction, right? It gives you something to move the bolus of food around your mouth up against and, and that sort of thing. So in, in terms of a cleft palate, which may or may not um, occur with uh, a cleft lip, which is a slightly different thing, it's usually to one side because there are, like I say, there are three masses and two masses for the palate. Anyway, without too much embryology, the palatal shelves normally meet in the midline and fuse, forming a complete palate. Now, if they don't occur, um, it could be um, a shallow cleft or it could be a very deep cleft. So there could be a link between the nasal and the oral cavities. So this, for the baby, this is a congenital defect then, is going to give um, a number of problems with uh, feeding, breathing, speech when that develops and of course we talked about how the palate is associated with um, the eustachian tube and that sort of thing so it can also um, give rise to more in ear infections and that sort of thing and um, for most kiddies it can be fixed surgically fairly early um, but um, Cleft palate is associated with a number of developmental um, abnormalities, so it seems like there can be a number of different causes for it, but our old friends, the neural crest cells, uh, seem to be involved in those palatal shells forming, and since neural crest cells are involved in lots of other structures forming as well, anything that interferes with um, neural crest cell migration or proliferation or differentiation can cause this sort of structural abnormality and others elsewhere in the body as well. Um, but there, there, it's likely that there are a number of other reasons why cleft palate forms, not just because of neural crest cell stuff. Anyway, that's kind of a, a light embryological ending. Um, but that's it. So hopefully... That wasn't too much of a ramble, but I want you to be able to describe the hard palate is made of the maxilla and the palatine bones. It has some holes in it, those nerves and blood vessels run through it. Um, I want you to be able to describe the soft palate runs posterior to the hard palate and it's got those five muscles in it and uh, the soft palate is, is linked to the tongue, it's linked to the other structures laterally to it and it's linked to the pharynx so it can move, the soft palate can move to the tongue, the pharynx can be raised up to the soft palate, the soft palate can be pulled back to separate off the nasal cavity from the organ, all those sorts of things. Well, that's the, that's the sort of stuff I want you to be able to talk about. I've just thought, of course, if you're doing the cranial nerve exam, you look at the soft palate and see how it moves because that tells you about uh, cranial nerve 10 function, doesn't it? Because you've got this, this curve, right? You've got, you've got your curve with a uvula in the middle. So if the muscles on one side are weak, then the soft palate is going to be dropped on the weak side, which means the uvula is going to point towards the strong side. Do you see what I mean? If you think about the function. Soft palate, vagus nerve, cranial nerve 10 on both sides is, is, is innovating those muscles. So if one side is weak, that side is gonna drop. All right, see you next week.